was very brief because, of course, uh, we all want to move on and go to cocktail hour. Um, so, so I want to start with Bill. That's going to go in order. Um, I thought it was great, Bill, either what you were talking about and these, these behaviors that obviously we can look, look at across species. And you did mention, right, that some of the techniques that were talked about by Sandy could be used. Has that been done? Or are you working on that? Or is anybody working on that? Like trying to, because I mean, obviously your animals are constrained in ways humans aren't. So how, how much can we see these like types of things you're measuring with tele telemetry in animals, you know, using these technologies in humans? Yeah, for, for us, um, they definitely need to be um, in proximity to that receiver. And I, I think... No, I understand. What I'm asking about is like, you know, if you, if you had everybody's smartphone data, you could get some of this information, like locomotive act activity and things like that, presumably. Has, has there any been any attempt that you know of to... In psychiatry. To make the links, yeah. Well, sure. Just, not um, even in psychiatry, yeah. Ipsit um, from McLean Hospital has a big program on just looking at um, activity levels in, in psychiatric patients to see if it can predict um, uh, the onset of illness, relapse, things like that. Is that, what, is that what you mean? Yeah, I'm just trying to think, of, like, you know, how do we use these techniques that you have outside and how much do they match with what you're getting in animal models? I don't know if Ipsit is still here, but um, he uses just um, activity levels. Am I, am I giving this fair treatment? It's basically activity around a room or the person's home environment. Um, so it's, it's kind of analogous to what Bob is doing. Um, I think activity is the only endpoint okay. at this time. Right. And sleep would be a good one too. Yes. So my question for you, Bob, was how did you determine the syllables, the behavioral syllables? Because you know I'm a psych, I, you know I'm a psychologist by training, and you know cognitive psychologist. But and you know we we've spent a lot of time thinking about how to break down human behavior and mental life. So that's a critical question. So how did you determine your syllables, and do you have kind of an idea about how they match up to behavioral syllables for humans? Um, so the short answer is, wow. The short answer is we did not determine the identities of the behavioral syllables. The magic of the algorithm is that it takes advantage of the underlying uh, repetition and structure in the data to automatically identify the syllables for us, thereby uh, preventing us from becoming mouse psychologists at which we are demonstrably poor uh, and letting the data decide for us what constitutes a unit of behavior. And in fact, the way that the algorithm decides that perhaps um, one set of syllables is better than another is entirely via prediction. So, you know, the, the algorithm chooses what the best set of syllables is by figuring out which set of syllables lets it forecast as far in the future as possible. And that's an objective benchmark for deciding how many parts of behavior they are. And in fact, in behavioral neuroscience, um, you know, we've essentially lacked this kind of benchmark, and we spent 100 years arguing with each other about what constitutes a useful or not useful description of behavior. So I think a part of the conceptual change we're, we're hoping to bring to the field is, is that we should be thinking about prediction as a way of objectively deciding what's important about parts of behavior. Mm -hmm. All right, my question for, um, for Rajia, am I saying your name correctly? Yes. Okay. Um, so, you know, one of the things you, you mentioned was, you know, you were talking about going from the macaque uh, to the marmoset. And this is just something, this is, you know, maybe I'm naive, but this is just something I always wonder about. You know, as a, somebody who studies humans, and we've looked sort of, you know, I've, I've heard stories about how this, this, uh, this type of mouse, you know, this, this works in the mouse but not the rat. When we look at, you know, different species of primate models, would I expect to see, so you have an, you, you suggest an autism model in the macaque. Am I going to be able to take the exact same behaviors in the macaque and if you do the same genetic manipulation, see the exact same deficits in the marmoset? How variable is it? And you know, what does that say about how variable it is when it gets to humans? That's a very good question. Um, uh, unfortunately, we don't have uh, enough shank three animals in uh, marmoset yet. but. I, it, it's, an, it's a question that's definitely on my mind because there, those are different species and, and a lot of people are already making assumptions that oh, what, what, we're, what, we're, seeing, what we're seeing in our uh, Shang-3 macaques um, is going to inform us for what we can expect in the, in the marmoset. Uh, of course, we have to use all of the information that we have, um, but we 
We, it's an empirical question. We don't know how similar they are going to be. Did you want to add something to that? I just wanted to add that the Shank 3 mouse model is also um, known to show autism-like behaviors as well. Isn't that correct? So yes. there's, there's a great cross-species. Um. It's true. The, the Shank 3 uh, mice, they show um, uh, re uh, more repetitive behaviors and some uh, social uh, deficits. But, um, of course, you know, betwe between mice and monkeys, then you, the, the, the species divide is even bigger. So then you also have to ask, like, like okay, it, 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 it may look similar in the mouse, but is it really similar? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. yeah, that's the question I'm always asking myself. Um, okay, Cameron. Mm -hmm. So I just want to say yes, we need much better novel wireless technologies. Um, and it was really fascinating work. Uh, but is there anything on the horizon you see in this regard in, for humans? And also, what are sleep nuclei? <laughs> uh, can you tell us more about that? Yeah, sure. So, so in, in terms of translating this exact technology to humans, uh, yes, there are platforms that, that you can leverage for this. But, but really, this is, f this is more developed for tools for animal studies, you know, right? to, to free them up, to remove those tethers, to reduce the behavioral constraints on the animals themselves. Uh, so yes, there are platforms that are based on near-field you know, NFC uh, you know, communication for that, um, but that's really not the purpose of these. The, the translational side on this is really focused on, on getting better preclinical data from animals so that you can make better predictions you know, moving forward with that. I mean, somehow, I, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but I feel like if anybody who's doing it, the Army is, I could be wrong about that. I don't know. <laughs> so, no Darpa? insight. We can uh, the rest. <laughs> yeah, right. So, so we're always looking to, to free up, right? So, is yeah. there any way that any time that you can reduce the form factor, any time that you can uh, reduce batteries? I mean, batteries are you know for soldiers in particular is a huge weight burden right now. So, any technology that you can use that reduces that is, is absolutely beneficial across the board. Not necessarily just for for neuroscience, but for anything that's powered. Right, so, so absolutely, you know, energy harvesting uh, at its most basic level is a huge concern for us and, and something we're putting a lot of effort into right, within the Army. And, and sleep, I just don't know what you mean by sleep sure, nuclei. Sure, so, so sleep nuclei, there are particular centers in the brain, uh, th and this does go across species, uh, that are, are particular for, say, REM sleep, you know, that, that was brought up. So uh, non-REM sleep, there are some other, uh, other brain regions that particularly fire only or, or most prominently during REM sleep. Um, one that we're really, that we're really interested in is down in the brainstem, uh, the sublateral dorsal nucleus uh, for REM sleep atonia, that's one. Uh, and that does go across from, from rodents all the way up to, to humans. It's you know, uh, sort of ubiquitous across that. Um, the other one is the locus ceruleus. Uh, so that's, a, that's another one for arousal. Uh, also, you see that across species. So are you having success in, in, in manipulating these in rodents and changing sleep patterns? Yes. Cool. Yeah, absolutely, you know, we, we can do that, absolutely. Yeah. And, and that is one of the beauties of studying sleep is, is that the, the sleep architecture and sort of the basic wiring diagrams do hold true by and large across species. Uh, uh, you know, when, and since it is such a, an old, uh, you know, sort of old behavior, if you will, right, you know, that, that's passed so, on. And have you done it with um, sort of PTSD models of, of sleep disturbance in rodents? No, we haven't yet. And I, <coughs> the closest is, is probably Bill's study that they published this last year in the Journal of Neuroscience looking at, at some anxiety behaviors. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's actually how we got, got in contact. Uh, so, so we're also working with Sam Golden. Uh, he's developed some other PTSD models in, in mice. Mm -hmm. uh, so once we have these devices in a, a, a format that we can manufacture and really start, start asking some of these questions, then, then we're going to do that. So we're probably a couple of months away from, from being able to, to actually employ them. Mm -hmm. um, but that is the, the goal to do that in the very near term. Okay. Other questions? Sleepy audio. Good, we have one. <laughs> Yay. Terrific panel, and uh, you all gave very good talks. Um, I had a thought about um, uh, behaviors being similar across species or not, um, say with Sheng 3, and I think it's really important to look at the circuits that the genotype is affecting before you can make any conclusions about the behavior across species. And I was impressed by the idea of finding a neurosignature for the different syllables in your work, and then I was wondering, if this is uh, something that you could do in non-human primates as well, is to link the behavior that you're seeing to a neural signature uh, like your colleague has done. 
that seems like the way to bring this together. Totally, and that is the direction uh, we intend to go. Um, uh, I think an, an interesting uh, point here is also, um, irrespective of how similar the behavior is to behaviors in humans, uh, in our genetic models, um, even if the behavior is not exactly similar, if we can figure out what happens in the circuitry in development due to a, a mutation like that, and we can correct it in an animal, uh, then ho hopefully it, it will translate to, uh, to humans. That, that is the future where we hope to go. Bob, uh, thank you. Wonderful talk, wonderful pants. I had a specific question. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the syllables that you see put together in a mouse exploring its territory, the, the 40 syllables come from looking at a mouse exploring territory in isolation. If you put two mice together, right, and start to look at the syllables, you know, does the algorithm pull out the same set of 40, I mean, plus whisker pulling, or is it actually, do you see something different, and can you see selective deficits? say in an autism model as right. opposed to something else. Yeah, so again, like one of the main strengths of the algorithm is that nothing's predefined, and so anything that's new and is repeated more than a couple times, the algorithm will automatically define as a new behavioral syllable if in fact allows the algorithm to better predict an animal or a group of animals' future behavior. And so that means that when we have two animals together in the bucket or in a, in a three-chamber social assay or in some more enriched context, in fact, many more syllables are expressed. And, and many of those syllables are in common with those that you'd you see, we see in the open field. And many are unique and uh, uniquely defined social interactions or interactions with objects in the arena. Uh, what's nice about this framework is also, you know, we often have um, mouse mutants where you look down at the mutant and you know something's funny, right? the funny looking kid phenomena, but you can't put your finger on what's wrong. And what's great here is that um, the system kind of mathematically encapsulates those phenotypes and allows you to understand the relationship to normal behavior. I have a question for Sandeep. Um, can you say a little bit more about um, beyond the syllables, like words and sentences and paragraphs and um, how that, you know, how that, um, how, how easy or difficult it might be to predict those in, in relation to the syllables. Right, yeah, so that, that's, a, that's a spectacular question. Actually, we chose the term syllable quite deliberately because we know that there's higher order structure that's kind of, uh, that's, that's represented in our behavior. I and mean, we know from, from what we're talking about today that of course, you know, we have ordered and structured behavior that's predictable at fine time scales and yet we all go to sleep and we all wake and so all of those fine time scale behaviors are embedded in this higher order rhythm. And so, you know, we can look at the data that we've generated, uh, and when we, especially when we image more and more mice for longer, and we can clearly see signatures of higher order structure. The structure that I described today is at the sub-second time scale. There's clearly structure that's occurring at the sort of minute time scale. There's actually some more structure about the five minute time scale. And we're actually interested in building out this inferential framework to discover the complete hierarchy of, of behavior across all time scales. And what's interesting, I think, just and it's worth thinking about, is, you know, why is it that, that um, the time scales at which behavior is organized why is that discrete? You know, why are there these privileged timescales at which we tend to organize our behavior? We can understand sleep and wake because of the sun, right? But it turns, and, it, and so I think it's an it's a interesting neuroscience problem to ask, you know, why is it that we have so many interdigitated rhythms that govern our daily lives? I, I'm gonna do one final question, and that's and just for everybody, whoever wants to jump in. Um, at least it's sort of in the, in the anxiety world, the one that I'm more familiar with. The, 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 there's been a lot of, uh, talk recently of the failure of drug development based on animal models. Um, so, you know, and so I think, you know, this kind of is one of the problems with translation. So I just kind of was hoping some of you could comment on why do you think we, we haven't gotten it, gotten it right so far? I can tell you that that is one reason why we went to primate models, because we hope that that's going to be translate better to uh, humans, but we'll see. As a veteran of the drug company industry, I used to work at a drug company, um, I can tell you that in my opinion, a major problem is that the data are not continuous. They're snapshots. I think the analogy is if you're a cardiologist and you're looking at an EKG, basically looking at one heartbeat instead of the entire pattern. Um, and I think it's, it's a massive failure, but it, it, it's built into the business model. You need answers fast, the 
time is money. Um, you need to make quick decisions about whether drugs are destined to be good or bad. Um, this is the way that um, that the industry basically grew up and I think ultimately failed. And how, is, how has that changed? Hmm. Well, it hasn't changed yet because there are no drug companies doing CNS research anymore. But I think there's opportunity um, in developing the things like Bob has. Um, there's a company out there called Psychogenics that uses kind of uh, continuous telemetry. So I think, you know, there's opportunity here with the, with the massive failure uh, of drug development in CNS and psychiatry. There's opportunity for new models, but uh, I'm not sure we're there yet. Yeah, so, so I'll echo that. I agree completely. Uh, you know, and a lot of it gets down to timeline, which Bill just mentioned, and that go goes along with having automation, you know, so automate behavior that you're able to go through and pull some of this out. Automate EEG analysis, you know, for sleep scoring, you know, for automate temperature, you know, changes that, that you're able to statistically, you know, sort of uh, gauge on a real-time basis. So all of that will play a role together. Uh, but I think first and foremost, it's getting the industry to adopt more of the, the, the telemetry model and the continuous versus the very discrete looking at just a small temporal window when if you, if you look at just that window, you have the, the, the high probability of missing what is interesting and what you're really looking for. So I think if you take that, that, that can total continuous telemetry modeling, you pair that with automation in terms of analysis, uh, then you're going to start seeing a, a big difference in, in terms of uh, efficacy. I think there's two things at play here. One is that uh, the, the folks that do drug development want to situate current behavioral data in the decades of behavioral data that have already been established. And that creates a problem because those data are terrible and those experiments are awful. I recently had a fight with someone where... Uh, a little harsh. And, and, yet, and yet we have failed to do any translation, right? So I think, I think the evidence suggests that those approaches at least aren't working, you know? And so, you know, when we, I recently had a, an experience where I was trying to, I'm publishing a paper with someone who was a more traditional behaviorist, and we got into a screaming match over the insistence about using bar graphs and standard errors of the mean, rather than showing the distribution. Like a simple move forward is, as, as, you know, in, in which one now shows the data instead of summarizing it in this kind of deceptive way. That simple move forward is too much for, for certain people who have who have been bound to a certain type of behavioral neuroscience. So I think that's the first thing. The second thing, which I think is actually less, contro is less controversial, or more controversial than the first thing I said, <laughs> is that I think, I think there's been a, I think a big challenge here has been the fealty to the notion of face validity. I think that, that is a big problem. The idea that um, what you see in a mouse model for a disease, in order for that mouse model to be valid, has to look to you as an observer something like a thing that a human does. I think that's a big mistake. And what that has effectively done is bent that we, as people who are interested in psychiatry, have focused on a limited number of phenotypes that we can understand and are somewhat reminiscent of something born in humans, instead of making careful, quantitative, continuous behavioral measurements and using those behavioral measurements as biomarkers that give us access to things that are going on in the brains of the animals that we're studying that might teach us something about what drugs do. And because we are not focused on biomarker development and thinking about it from that way, because we're focused on these imagined ideas of, of face validity, we've been studying the wrong behaviors in the wrong way for decades now. And I think abandoning this idea that your, your marmoset has to twitch in exactly the way that a human does in order for that marmoset to teach you something really valuable about drug development, I mean, we have to, we have to abandon that notion. I mean, it's convenient that they twitch in a somewhat similar way. That's a convenient thing and it's reassuring, but it's not required. It's like, I'm sure that what you're doing is going to have a profound influence on our ability to develop drugs, regardless of whether or not that really reflects a thing, that a behavior that humans are actually generating. I wonder if I could just add to that. That was a terrific panel, and I totally agree with everything I just said. And I think in addition to the issue that, you know, 30 years of, of work on pharmacology was basically reinventing serotonin drugs because they made animals swim, and we interpreted that anthropomorphically that they were struggling. Um, but I think the flip side of that, what this whole conference is about, is that we don't yet have the human database for the syllables of human, human behaviors um, because we've, you know, sort of forced ourselves through our own history of saying, okay, schizophrenia is a disease, depression is a disease, et cetera, and we're currently in a place in psychiatry where we're really deconstructing the whole DSM, but we don't know what the more rudimentary behavioral data sets are that map onto these. And so I think the parallel work between the human dig digital phenotyping and the animal digital phenotyping, so we see what's shared in mammals, will create a whole new frontier of kind of where this stuff can go. So just great work. So I think it's, uh, it's cocktail hour? <laughs> yeah? Okay. <laughs>